What is up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Breathe and Air podcast, where everyday action meets extraordinary mindset. I'm pumped for you all to hear today's guest. For anyone that's interested in jiu-jitsu at a base level or even going into the deeper levels of jiu-jitsu and what it is, we have Milton Campus here today to kind of talk us through that. He has his own foundation, Jiu-Jitsu Foundation, that gives scholarships to kids. He has a podcast, Jiu-Jitsu for Dummies, as you can see in the back if you're watching. And he is also has a marketing background that has helped launch and do all these great things around the sport of Jiu-Jitsu. So Milton, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Mason. I appreciate it, man. Absolutely. So give me a little bit of your background with just the sport in general and kind of how you got into this passion. Yes. Yeah, so uh, it goes back to when, I'm, when I was a kid. Uh, uh, I'm 47 now. I found jujitsu at 41. I shouldn't say I found it, but I finally had the guts to get on the mat at 41. <laughs> but back when I was a kid, you know, I, I used to watch, you probably won't remember this, you look like a, a young buck. Um, you know, Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, Wide World of Sports on ABC. You know, Channel 7 in New York, they used to run fights like that were being uh, held out in parking lots in Vegas. I mean, that's the way they used to do it. There was no big MGM grand. It was just, uh, you know, some of the bigger names in, in boxing. Uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and uh, Hagler Hearns, those guys. I grew up watching that stuff with my dad. So always had like a punching bag in the house. My dad would do jump rope. I got a punching bag when I was older. And I just fell in love with boxing to start. Uh, as an adult, again, always had a bag hanging in my house, would uh, kind of look at YouTube videos, you know, kicks and kind of a little bit of kickboxing, Muay Thai, uh, always just kind of self-taught. And then as I got older, uh, I had some friends get me into the UFC, you know, get, you know, I started to watch the UFC. My first UFC was a, a Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell fight. Yeah. And people, my, my roommates were like, you, you don't know what this is. I'm like, what do you, I've never heard of cage fighting, but what? They're like, you're sit down, sit down, let's watch this fight. And it just turned into like my first love. I, I mean, it's like boxing, what, what is that? That's like flag football compared to what they do in, in the ring to me now, at least. Uh, still a fan, but more of a, a fan of the UFC. Uh, so just years of watching, I just always wanted, you know, I wrestled a little bit in junior high and I, I, I just wanted to get on the mat, I wanted to learn those things. And I, I just uh, always said, yeah, I gotta get in better shape. I need to be more flexible. And finally, at 41, right before my 41st birthday, the, the, uh, my birthday's in June, like a couple of weeks and before uh, in June, I, I jumped on the mat. A family friend opened a gym, and, uh, and it's been a wild, crazy ride since then. I started a jiu-jitsu t-shirt site, then the podcast came about, then the foundation, all while having, holding down my regular job. Actually, when I started, I still owned my own marketing company, then started to work for another marketing company. So uh, a man wearing many hats. Yeah, absolutely. That was a lot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love it. I love all of it. You know, it's, remember back when Blockbuster was a thing. I, I think it's basically been a <laughs> Now I think they're gone. But yeah. back when Blockbuster was a thing. You had to go in, you know, rent their DVDs out. I remember that was the first time I saw UFC fights. Me and my dad would get the old Gracie fights, like mm. way back. So and then obviously the love for that, you know, continued with Tito and Chuck mm. and, uh, you know, all of those big time names that help, you know, Shogun who I loved him too. just yeah. guys that, you know, you watch the sport now compared to then. And obviously it's blown up now and, and Dana White's done an incredible job over there, but I was actually doing some digging on like the, base like the background of jiu-jitsu where it came mm. from and it actually broke i thought this was pretty interesting i'm sure you know all this, but for our listeners it broke I, I hope i do i better do it my friends are going to kill me <laughs> <laughs> so it derives from the japanese word ju ju which means gentle and then jitsu which means art so mm -hmm. art and we look at this sport as oh, a lot of people look at the sport as oh, this is a violent sport, you know, we think of UFC, we think of fighting, but in reality, it really is an art. So tell mm -hmm. me a bit about the art of jiu-jitsu and kind of what that means to you. Yeah, I'll, let's talk a little bit about, and I'm going to do my best to, to do it justice, and I'm going to kind of like real quick overview. Um, jiu-jitsu really stemmed from judo. Jiu-jitsu, judo was brought over to Brazil, 
or to South America, specifically Brazil, uh, in the early 1900s, kind of jujitsu was born from that. There's the Ju Jitsu, Ju Dash Jitsu, that is more of the Japanese style, which is a little bit more stand up uh, with the throws, striking along with the ground game. When it went to Brazil, the Gracies took it and really turned it into more of ground fighting, the grappling side. And, and therein lies that gentle art. The gentle art is for us, when I go to train, we're not striking. Unless I'm going to an MMA class, which I haven't done in quite some time, we, we, we are grappling on the ground. Sometimes we start from the ground, maybe we do throws and takedowns, but other than the takedown, the hardest hit you're gonna get is, pro is that takedown. So that gentle art stems from, it's about subduing your opponent, mm -hmm. potentially having to break a limb, choke somebody out, if you want to call that gentle, uh, but it's more about subduing somebody. Um, yeah. I could, you know, I'm confident enough that if I was in a situation where somebody was trying to strike me, I tell people who don't really understand it, all we want as jujitsu practitioners is to get our hands on our opponent. If I can grab you, that's why like we, we, we still train in a gi. Uh, we do know gi like what you would see in the ring at UFC, you know, what we wear rash guards and shorts. But I do both. So when you train in a gi, you know, it's all about grabbing like your shirt right there. I would go for like your collar and maybe the sleeve. And if I can control you there, I just need to get my hands on you. And as, if you don't know jujitsu, I'm going to be able to, I don't care your size. I don't care how strong you are. I'm probably going to be able to maneuver myself to a good, to a, a good position, even if I was on bottom. So, um, you know, for us, it's again, it's, it's a little bit more about, subduing the, the attacker or opponent and a little less about trying to knock somebody out. You know, we, those of us in this world who also train MMA or do stand up Muay Thai, kickboxing, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's a mix. We would call that, that would be like an MMA class. You would call that an MMA class. Usually most schools do Monday, Wednesday, Friday is jujitsu. And then Tuesday, Thursday is going to be stand up with an MMA class. So it's like you're usually wearing small gloves so that you can do your jujitsu, but you're starting with stand up with takedowns into ground striking and jujitsu. So that, you know, that, that's kind of the difference for me again, I'm, you know, 47 now. Um, I consider myself a hobbyist. You know, I've got younger friends that train and, and compete. There are lots of tournaments every single weekend for jiu-jitsu, believe it or not. You wouldn't know until you're in the world that there's a competition going on somewhere in the world, probably 10 competitions going on on any given Saturday in different parts of the world. So, you know, everybody has their, their kind of own path with jiu-jitsu. For me at my age, it's more about the exercise. It's more about the self-defense aspects. Uh, I love helping and talking about it. But when I'm doing it, I'm not doing it with the intent to ever step in a ring. I'm not doing it with the intent of getting on the mat, although I promised myself I would do a tournament at every belt level. I'm a purple belt, so I'm at like my third level. It's white, blue, purple, brown, and then black. So, uh, you know, I, I promised myself I did get on the mat at purple, so now I got to do brown and black. Yeah. I would love to, if I was retired from my regular job, be uh, you, you really need to train a ton to even do these amateur events. So, uh, so you know, that, that's where I am. But, you know, again, at the end of the day, everyone has their own journey with jujitsu. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, for kids, you know, we'll, we'll start kids as young as four. And you play jujitsu with them. You let, they have to be, you have to be playful with them. Some coaches are a little bit more strict. But as you start to go up in age, everybody has a different reason for doing it. It could be, you know, the little kid is usually doing it because mom and dad want to get him into an after school program. The teenager might be doing it because he's getting bullied at school. Teenager might be getting into it because he's the bully in school and the parents. And I've actually have a good example of that situation happen with one of my co-hosts and his son uh, and, and, and the, the kid that tried to bully him. Uh, and then as you get into the adults, you know, there's, you know, men, women and adults, everybody has their reason for doing it. Mine was never to compete. Mine was to, I wanted to study the art. I truly wanted to learn. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I think, you know, that, that's where I am in my journey. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's so cool that it can encompass so many different types of people, types of reasons. And like you said, it could be the kid that's getting bullied or the one that was bullying and he needs to get humbled on the. Yeah. Floor. I'll tell you what, if I lined up it just in regular clothes, if you, you were coming out, we were going to go have a beer and I invited 10 friends, five of them did jujitsu and five of them did not. Believe me, you wouldn't, other than maybe the ears, you, you'll see the cauliflower ears on some of them. 
you would not be able to pick out who is, who does jujitsu and who doesn't. Right. I train with real estate agents. I train with accountants. I'm a marketing guy. Uh, I train with uh, cooks, chefs, waitresses, bartenders. It, it, it's, it's all over the map. We train in, I train at a place called Fight Sports. It's uh, Fight Sports in Coral Springs, South Florida. The main fight sports, I don't know if you've ever heard the name Cyborg. He's Cyborg, but he's the jiu-jitsu Cyborg. There's some, there is some MMA Cyborgs. This is Roberto Cyborg Abreu, who owns the fight sports system. And then you're essentially an affiliate or like a franchise of, of his location. So my school is a franchise. Uh, my coach goes down and trains with those beasts in their black belt pro training. My coach just won uh, an event called Fight to Win. Uh, at his uh, weight class, he he's two and zero in this organization called Fight to Win, which travels the country and does bigger televised. It's on an app called Flow Grappling, but they're televised events for us. So, again, everybody has it. You know, he's a gym owner, but he's also doing that to not only you know test himself, but to promote the school. So, like, like everybody has a different reason. A woman might 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 do it because she's feeling threatened by a man, or has been attacked, or sexually assaulted. And again, uh, you know, my world of between the podcast, I'm a, uh, an ambassador for We Defy, so we definitely try to promote it amongst kids, especially with the foundation. Yep. And then I'm also an ambassador for the We Defy Foundation, where we try to spread the word on, uh, on its health benefits for combat wound and veterans specifically. So, uh, so again, you know, it's just all across the map. We, we say jujitsu is for everyone. We have 80-year-old you know, people getting belts and, uh, you know, we have, uh, there's a jujitsu grandma. You can check her out on, on Instagram. Uh, uh, there's a, she calls herself the jujitsu grandma. And she just did a couple of tournaments this past year and she has her blue belt. Oh. So, you know, again, it's just a different level. That woman doesn't expect that she's going to step on the mat with me or cyborg or my coach, but it's working for her. And for most of us, it's, you know, exercise, self-defense, stress relief, stress release and relief, you know, like, ah, after a long day, you get to literally go and choke somebody and it's okay. And then they're, and you're, and they're your friend and you might get a beer with them after. Uh, it, it's that amazing of a sport, much different than other martial arts. And I, I won't talk uh, bad about any other martial arts. It's just our martial art. We fight in every class. You know, we don't break boards. Uh, we don't hit pads. We are fighting without punching. We are fighting each other and trying to strangle each other at least for a half hour in every one hour class. Hey. So it's much, much different than most of the other martial arts. Yeah, I think, I think it's so unique in, in that aspect of it too, that you guys are, when you're, when you're there, you are performing the art. There is obviously a lot of techniques and little things that go into that. But like you said, the stress relief, the fitness, and then the mental side of it. What, mm -hmm. what have you seen benefit-wise on the mental aspect of this? For me, it doesn't matter how bad of a day I had. At least for a few hours after class, you, you've let it all go. Excuse me. I always tell my wife, if you want to argue with me and you want to win, bring it up after the class. Uh -huh. Not when I'm on my way, when I've had so, so much – excuse me, I've had so much stress and I, it's a long day. I worked an eight, nine hour day. Uh, I haven't gotten an, in a nap before, before going to class. I'm cranky. I've got a headache. Uh, get me when I'm coming back. Cause when I come back, I mean, it's, it's, you know, just, it's all been cleansed. It's, it's gone. It's gone at least for a, a little bit of, of that time for a lot of us. Uh, you know, there was a company that put out a t-shirt during the pandemic now that said jujitsu is not a crime because of the schools getting closed down and some of our most famous gym owners and competitors who own gyms literally had to shut down, close their doors, not close their doors for the pandemic, shut down, closed down, could not afford, could not get their, their landlords to give them a deal or to hold off on rent. So, you know, it's this, it's this amazing, look, a guy that gets angry and punches a wall, you know, like we, we all know that. And, and maybe we've even been that guy. I've been that guy. Yeah. That moment that you punch that wall and either you hurt your fist or you get it out. And now you're looking at the hole and going, God, you know, I got to patch this hole now <laughs> that in a different way. You've punched that wall because you needed to release something and you feel better after you did it. Your hand might hurt, but you feel there's maybe you weren't right for doing it. And I'm not telling people to start punching walls, but that feeling of release is what we get on the mat in jujitsu. Uh, a lot of guys like they'll miss the warmups. 
and maybe because we it's warm ups, drill, and then fight. Yeah. So for first 15 minutes is probably warm ups, 15 to 20 minutes of, of uh, like drilling a very specific move or a technique. And then it usually moves to, okay, it's going to be 20 to a half hour. And you could say longer than the hour, but of, of at least that of, of actual sparring and fighting, what we call roll, we call it rolling. Yeah. So, you know, that we need that when you don't have that, it drives you crazy. I mean, you, you miss it. You, you just imagine training every day for six years or like training three days a week for six years. And then it's taken away for this entire pandemic, 10 months. It is very, very difficult for guys with PTSD, guys with mental, you know, mental health issues. Um, anybody who needs that release, it becomes very, very difficult. We get addicted to that part of it. We get addicted to that release. Uh, I guess something like, a. I guess like a, somebody who parachutes or does extreme sports would say that adrenaline rush. Well, what? it's that for us. It's not necessarily adrenaline. We probably have that adrenaline happening, but that release of all that tension that comes out by literally, I mean, killing, trying to kill somebody without actually killing them. Yeah. It's an amazing feeling. I must sound like a psycho right now. Right? <laughs> I love it. So it's, it was funny. I, I played football in college and I remember one of my coaches saying, you got, you know, guys like, take this all in because this is the only time you'll legally be able to commit assault. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And speaking of that, I saw a video of this kid, this high school football, uh, high school football game guy got ejected and you probably saw this. I'm sure a lot of people did. It went viral. He like ran off of the sidelines for those of y'all who haven't seen it, look it up. It's crazy. And, uh, like basically just body slam the ref. Um, i yeah, I think he got arrested too. And yeah, so not his first incident, by the way. That was his the second time he's done something like that. Apparently, it happened on the soccer field as well. I don't know. If, I, I did not see the video, but I saw a breakdown of the video. So I people would look at him and go, you know, this kid needs to be in jail, or he. Yeah. I look at him and say, again, um, I do jujitsu, so I know the effects. He needs jujitsu. He needs a release for that. Now the football is probably the release. And there might be something more going on there. Yeah. But somebody like that, again, I'll tell you the story about uh, my, my friend's, uh, his son's bully at school. Yeah. Yeah. But a guy like that, he needs that release. He, maybe he's not getting it completely from football. And look, maybe he got caught up in something. Who knows? But the second time, he needs some type of release. So there's something more going on. Usually stems back to home, right? Bullying is usually, uh, you know, you've got maybe getting hit by a parent or you're getting bullied. So you, you're a bully. Again, I'm 47 now. Uh, I have got lots of regrets about kids that I bullied, but most of the time it was because I was being bullied. So I was being bullied by somebody, you know, crap rolls downhill, right? And I would bully, some, bully somebody who was weaker than me. Uh, and in that moment, it makes you feel good. But looking back on it, I don't feel good about ever doing it. And, right. uh, you know, but, but so I'll tell you this, this quick story. So one of my co-hosts, his name is Mauricio. His son got into a scrap with a kid at school. Now I shouldn't say got into a scrap, was being bullied by a kid at school. That kid, I don't think that he knew that he did jujitsu because actually Mauricio would tell his son, like he doesn't wear jujitsu shirts. He doesn't go to school talking about it. Although some of his friends do it. So I'm sure kids knew yeah. the kid was bigger than him, started to bully him. My uh, Mauricio son took him down, held him down. It gets broken up. They call Mauricio to come pick up his son. You got to come to the school. He's been in a fight. He says, first thing he said is, <laughs> this is, I'm retelling somebody else's story. Mauricio said to the guy, is the other kid okay? Because he knew what his son was capable of. Uh, obviously, the other kid didn't. But he wound up taking him down, holding him down, gets broken up. That kid, the bully, now goes to the same school and those two boys are friends. So that kid needed some type of relief, release. I don't know him very well. He's just starting to train in our adult classes because these, these young men get a little, usually at 16, they, they, they change into the adult classes. Uh, but he's so big that he does train with the adults anyway. I'm not exactly sure of his age. I think he might actually be 14 or 15. Yeah. But they're friends. That boy needed a, a, a release. He needed something. He needed a way to get rid of that energy. And there is nothing more humbling. And we love doing this in jujitsu. I know many stories of this happening where somebody comes in, they're talking a big game. We all do, hey, hey well, you know, what do you do? Yeah, you know, well, I like the UFC. I did that. I did that to my coach. Well, what do you know about jujitsu? Well, you know, I watch a lot of UFC, so I kind of know the moves. I wrestled a little in high school. We all want to act like we know something. 
And then he proceeds to strangle me in 20 different ways. Well, you take a bully and you put him on a mat. There's nothing more humbling than you putting that kid on a mat with a girl of equal size, same age, and she manhandles him, or maybe not manhandles him, but all of a sudden arm bars him or puts him in a choke. Mm -hmm. That moment, you can almost always see it. You can almost take a picture, like a mental picture. You see the look on that, that boy's face, or that man, for because this happens with adults too. You take a mental picture of that person in that moment, and it's holy crap. Now, it's holy crap, and they go one of two ways. Either they go, hell no, I'm not going to let this girl beat me up, and they never come back. Or they go, I must learn more. I need to know what the heck she just did. Exactly, boom, right? Mind blown. I need to know what, what she did, how she did it. I want more. We, I, I say this. I shouldn't say we say this in jiu-jitsu. I say this. You either love jiu-jitsu or you hate jiu-jitsu. I happened to fall into the carrier. I fell in love with it so much that I had to know more. Two hours of training a day for my first couple of years, five days a week, open mats on the weekend, going to getting with my coach and going to other schools and training for hours on the weekend. Mm-hmm. I just ate it up, opened up the t-shirt company, did the pocket. Like I, I'm, uh, I have the tattoo on my arm. I'm always wearing a jujitsu shirt. My wife says that jujitsu looks like it threw up on me. So <laughs> that's how, that's how far I got into it. So uh, most of the people that I train with, especially once they, once you're doing it a few months, it's either you're in or you're out. And uh, most people wind up getting, you know, like uh, a little obsessed with it because it's just when you start to learn, you know, at white belt to blue belt, you start to learn, you're like so excited. Then you get to like a blue belt and then the, the higher belts really start giving it to you. They weren't giving to you as a white belt. They were teaching you. Now you're a blue belt. Now they give it to you. And then you wind up realizing, oh my God, there's so much I don't know. But it, to come full circle, it's just an amazing feeling, but extremely humbling. You absolutely have to leave your ego at the door. Right. And that's something that I love about. I think that in today's age, it's obviously hard to be present at times. Mm-hmm. You know, we have so much stimulus coming at us from all different directions. And like you said, when you're describing jujitsu and your passion, the way it makes you feel, the endorphins you get, all this, it similar to skydiving, like you said, it's something where you have to be in the moment. You can't not be in the moment if if you're, you know, grappling with someone on the ground, like they're trying to choke you out, you're trying to, you know, get them, however it goes, but you're in the moment and nothing else is going on. You're present. I think that's something that is something to be said about the sport in general is that you have to be present. And that's why it is. It's everything else just fades away. You could, again, you could go and and I've had this happen where I've gone to jujitsu and I've just had the worst day. And I don't want to be there. And I can't get through the warm-ups. And it's been a week. And I feel so out of shape. And my cardio sucks. And, and I've got every excuse in the book. Yeah. And there's my coach. You know, a lot of times when I show up, they're just finishing the, the, the kids' classes. And I always hear him in the back of my head with, you know, there's always usually a little speech that he'll give to the kids' class at the end of that class. Mot- something motivational. And he'll always talk about how I didn't want to get up today. I didn't want to come into the gym. My back hurt. My foot hurt. Uh, My wife was mad at me. Whatever. But you go. The best thing you could do is show up. And, you know, look, I worked out for a long time, you know, doing weights and and weight training when I was younger, before I got into jujitsu. And I had that. You get that element. You get a little bit of that feeling. But it's nothing like, again, literally somebody trying to choke you. Right. You break an arm. So, you said before, you know, about being present. You absolutely, if you're not present when you get there, <laughs> you will be present once you start doing some drills with somebody who really knows what they're doing. And then all of a sudden, you usually, you drill with somebody and that's going to be your first role. It's usually a five to six minute role. So as soon as that guy that's really been giving it to you in the drills, and you're like, oh God, he's heavy. Oh, knees everywhere. Oh, what's going on? And then you got to roll with that guy. Believe me, you're going to be present. You know, yeah. So uh, it's, it's an amazing sport. Obviously, you could say, I, I mean, I love it so much. Yeah, uh, it's become such a, a huge part of my life, and um, you know, I I I love spreading the word and and just you know telling people about it. Let me let me ask you a question. Now we I know every time I talk to somebody, 
everyone has a story about at some point they did some karate when they were a kid. Did you ever do any martial arts or, or any type of, you know, fighting sport? You know, really, I was net, I was always into, you know, football, basketball, all of these things. I had always had this weird interest for it. Um, whenever I was young, like I said, it was something my dad and I did together. So it was always, even before it became like a big thing, like it is now, I was always interested in always watching and more so learning about, uh, I was so interested in the mental aspect of it and not necessarily the fighting side of things because during wrestling I was doing basketball or football or how, how that turned out. But honestly, I have no physical fighting background. And, and yeah. did you wrestle? You just said you wrestled? No, I never, I mean, oh, okay. friends, but you know, not like wrestled in uh you know, high school or anything competitive wise, mm-hmm. but it's, uh, like I said, you're, you're, you were starting in your 40s. I yeah. mean, to anyone listening, there's no excuses to not be able to start. If you're a man, woman, if you're old, young, I mean, 80 years old, that's incredible. So let me, let me tell you this. You, you know, you, you bring up an interesting point. And, and again, I preach this all the time. Um, if you could see them like right here, this is the tip of their logo up there. That's the We Defy Foundation logo. Yeah. Uh, the show is uh, myself. I, I really make the show. I, I applied and uh, my, one of my co-hosts was a, a We Defy ambassador. Uh, he's a Marine. It's all military guys who started the organization. One of it, it, this, this goes to the point of like jujitsu for everyone. Yeah. One of the founders of the We Defy Foundation, I believe he's now a purple belt is a triple amputee. Wow. He's a triple amputee. So there is no one. His name is Joey Bozik, if you, anybody wants to look him up. B-O-Z-I-K. I believe his handle, and it's not spelled exactly, uh, I think it's three L's, it's Hell on Wheels is his, uh, is his handle. <laughs> I love it. I think it might be a Z for the wheels, and Hell is three, I think it's three L's. But if you look up Joey Bozik, you'll, you'll see. Yeah. If there is anybody listening to this, or you ever tell this story, you tell somebody, wow, I heard this cool story. That when you don't want to get out of bed in the morning because you're a little tired, when you don't want to get on the mat or you don't want to go shoot some hoops or you're, you know, somebody, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your whoever is trying to get you out of bed in the morning and do something. Remember that there's a guy with one arm that is probably getting ready to go to jujitsu practice and is probably going to be doing a, t- a tournament that weekend. So there is nothing that anybody can say like, oh, I'm tired. That's what I think about when I say I'm tired. I hear my coach's voice. I think about Joey. I think about just wanting, you know, then it gets me into the mindset. I I have a little bit of a joke kind of with myself. Once I put on a rash guard and I start to get dressed, you know, we talk about, this isn't just me. We talk about it like it's like putting, like a warrior putting on his armor. Yeah. Once I put on a rash guard, I'm like, oh yeah, it's on. Like I'm putting on my equipment to go to battle. And it's such this incredible feeling again, someone like Joey who gets out of, who has, you know, to, I don't want to say struggle. I won't put words in his mouth, but you know, you're a triple amputee. And and again, you know, he was, he's uh, wounded in combat. So, um, you know, a triple amputee to the point where this is how crazy or how uh, seductive jujitsu is. He actually went in for surgery to have a little bit more of a limb removed. I believe it was a leg because it was getting in the way of his jujitsu. Oh, wow. He told us that story. We did a, we did a zoom. He, he's been on a podcast since, but we did a zoom meeting uh, with uh, kind of, we suffi- we defy supporters that myself and one of my co-hosts we, we moderated. Uh, and we just, you know, we did like a Q and a, and you know, we had listeners ans- answer questions and uh, people were able to be on that zoom and do more of a conference style than a podcast. And he told that story had never heard that before blew my mind so again when when, if you're out there and you're thinking about the days getting the better me of of me life is getting the better of me think about joey look him up follow him he's an amazing guy but just think about that for a second how amazing wow this really like no milton can't be telling the truth look it up that's that's goosebumps right there and i i don't believe in coincidences this morning i literally was driving to the gym at six or whatever it was. And I got on my, uh, Instagram and I'm like, Hey, even the days that you don't want to do it. Cause I rolled around in bed. I was like, Oh, should I go to the gym? (laughs) Well, 
I, I finally got up. I'm like, if I don't do it, because I, of course, have fallen, you know, victim to laying in bed, then wishing I would have actually got up later. But I literally swear today said it on the story, like the days that you don't want to do it are the days that you will have the most growth when you push through it. Those yeah. are the days that you have to do that. And I think, I mean, even if it's that little reminder in your head, like, hey, how fortunate am I? You know, uh, we have people that are losing limbs fighting for our freedoms. Like, who am mm-hmm. I here and bitch, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, and again, if that's not enough to get somebody out of bed, something like that, again, for us, where I say leave the ego at the door, but we definitely, as jujitsu practitioners, keep track of which one of our training partners have tapped us before. Oh, yeah. So, if I know that guy that got close last class that might have almost gotten an arm or oh, just got that choke in right as the bell was ringing. I think about that guy and, and maybe this isn't the best advice to think about okay, that guy. I don't, not that I wanted to get better. I don't ever want him. If the closer he gets, the more I want to train, the further I want to get him away from ever being able to get that again. Uh, so uh, we want to be humble, but at the same time, if you're competitive, you can dip into that. You can kind of reach into that and go, well, I'm super competitive. This is why I'm going to get out of bed in the morning. Like, you know, shooting baskets, uh, you know, think about Michael Jordan and his story and getting cut from the, the team the first time that he went out to, uh, to and I'm not a basketball guy. I'm like, I, I don't watch any sports other than jujitsu and, and boxing and UFC. Yeah. But I, I understand the sports, but I just, I'm not like a fan. Right. But, uh, or at least I, I love going to games. I'll go to any game. It's amazing to be at a game, but like just to sit in front of a TV, that's not me. But, you know, look, again, it's just there's always motivation. And you think about a Michael Jordan who, you know, again, cut from a team at such a young age. And you're like, Michael Jordan got cut from a team. But what did he do? He went back. He just kept on shooting baskets. I, I don't know, like the hours that he put in, you oh, know, yeah. shooting and shooting. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where I draw from. That's how I feel. It's like, okay, that, that guy got too close. Let me go. I got to practice more. I just bought a, uh, uh, like a, a, an MMA dummy, an MMA dummy where you can kind of drill. It's like a big punching bag, but with like in the shape of a person ah. and, uh, you know, to drill on to like, okay, well with COVID, I can't train as much and maybe somebody gets sick and I don't, you know, whatever it may be. I've got some, I've got a dummy, literal jujitsu dummy to, to have here in the, in the house and, and actually be able to practice on. So again, when I, when I say that I've, <laughs> I've got over the edge, I've got over the edge with this. I have, I live and breathe that outside of my family. You know? Yeah. And that's, that's how you know that you're passionate about something. We, we always say, Oh, I, I like to do this. I, I really like to do this, but don't confuse hobby with passion and don't mm-hmm. confuse maybe what other people you think other people want from you to what you really want. I think Mm -hmm. it's easy to know when you have a passion, like you, there's, there's not much I can stand in. There will never be excuses that you will make to not get done what you need to get done. You got a rolling dummy because of COVID. If, If you don't have time or you can't go train you boom, there's your plan B. So there is no excuses to being able to do what you want to do if it's a passion. And I think that, you have to be honest with yourself about, is this, is, am I really passionate about this? Or (laughs) if you are, you won't have those questions. You won't have, Yeah, you you won't even ask. It just becomes so natural. It's uh, again, you know, I wake up on, I just know the days that I go, you know, non COVID days, it was like two or three days a week minimum. And then open mats on on Saturday and Sunday, which open mats are typically no warm up, stretch on your own. And then you're rolling. And every once in a while we, we call it, you got to pay your dues. You're, you got to pay for the Saturday for the, for the open mat and we'll do some drilling and it'll be a little bit more intense than a normal weekday. Uh, our open mats are usually um, nowadays, it's usually about 15 minutes of drill. So the coach will show something usually the entire week he's been teaching the kids and the adults, the same moves. And because it's a series and it's somebody new, you can always work on those on that series. So maybe it's a takedown into passing to side control on somebody like laying on top of them. You know, it's, it's always going to be a little bit different, but when you get to Saturday, because it's an open mat, that means that it's open. You, other people from other gyms can come and it's usually people that, you know, and training, but people you train with at another gym years ago, you invite them in. So now it's usually a high level of competition. So that drilling becomes even not competitive, but harder. They know those moves better. They're going to drill them harder. They might have a competition coming. They're going to drill them hard on you uh, because, uh, you know, we say you're going to fight 
like you train. So for guys that are super competitive or do that, do competitions, those guys, there's no like any wiggle room for them to like, you really can't give them a lot. They're going to rip off the arm and, you know, put it over their shoulder and go home that night. So um, yeah, you know, again, it goes back to everybody has a different reason for doing it, but every reason is a good reason. And it's never too late to start. Now, I say when I say it's never too late to start, not only jujitsu. Look, I love all kind of you know different martial arts. I don't train different martial arts. I respect them. I like them. I see the advantages to them. And because I know just from hitting the bag for years that I got a little bit of that release that I get in jujitsu. But you know, usually hitting a bag, you yeah. know, and then you start hitting somebody else. Okay, this feels better. But then again, literally choking somebody or ripping off an arm and, and really putting somebody in a compromising position, there, there's something to say. I tell every, at least try it once. Again, you'll love it or you'll hate it. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I opened up the floor a little bit that, uh, earlier today, actually, uh, about some questions from our fans about anyone who wants to ask questions, beginner level, okay. anything. So I have a few that I think actually transition pretty well into what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. This one's from Jake, and you spoke earlier about kind of how you had a fitness background, you'd always lifted weights, got a little bit of that rush from the weightlifting. But his question is, what's an appropriate amount of strength training to combine with jujitsu? Okay, that's a really good question. Did you say his name is Jake? Yep. That's a, that's a great question, Jake. And so let's talk a little bit about the flexibility side. Usually when you're really muscular, you don't have a lot of flexibility. Um, if you've seen even one UFC fight, you know, you've seen a guy holding guys on his back, another guy's holding his legs literally over his head and he's punching him in the face. That ha besides the punching part in jujitsu, that does happen. We actually train and we roll over our backs and we do, we fall on the floor, roll over our backs. So we do different, uh, different drills like that. So if you, if you do heavy lifting, you wind up being less flexible on the mat, you're carrying more weight you typically tire faster. So guys that come in, and again, it's, I, I smile because we know in the gym, when we see that big meathead come in, a big muscle-bound dude come in, uh, because I'm, I'm 230 and I'm usually one of the bigger guys in my class, even at, you know, for any age, um, I usually have the <laughs> – Sure. I used to get that guy. <laughs> I have the luxury of rolling with that guy for the first time he's ever rolled. And he's all, we call it being spazzy, but they'll learn quickly that that strength isn't everything. Okay. Yeah. He might be able to hold me down, but eventually he's going to make a mistake and I'm going to get a wrist lock. I'm going to get an arm bar. I'm going to get something. So to answer Jake's question for jujitsu, I would say it's a little bit more about lower weights, higher reps, right? Where you get a little bit more lean, you'll be strong, but lean versus trying to put on muscle mass. Um, again, ever since UFC brought on USADA and they do, you know, the, you know, testing for banned substances, you see these guys, like the biggest guys come into the ring, like uh, Brock Lesnar is a good, a good example that more, more people would know probably not just from the UFC, but from the WWE, yeah. they always have to give him like four months notice so that he can come off of whatever he's taking so that he can test and pass USADA. And uh, pass the USADA test. Plus, they usually um, like kind of give it to him really, really at the last minute. Like they don't do; they're not just showing up at his house while he's training. They're yeah. letting him wean himself off of whatever he's taking. So you'll notice he always comes into the UFC a little bit smaller. It's not because he wants to take the weight off; it's because he's not, um, you know, he's not using the things that he does. But a guy like him, you see him all crazy. Jiu-Jitsu guys, we love those guys. We love those guys that are big and bulky because. We also know, again, because we're not striking, so this is very specific to jiu-jitsu. I know I just have to let him tire out. I know how to protect myself from the bottom, keep him away, but I'm going to let him get tired, and then I'm going to pounce. So, again, high reps for strength, not for, uh, for building mass. If you want to build mass, jiu-jitsu is probably not going to be the right sport for you. Uh, boxing isn't going to be the right sport. Mm -hmm. No, none of the martial arts are going to probably be good for you because you are going to tire very, very quickly. Yeah, it's I think uh, it was McGregor. Yeah, it was the McGregor fight a little while ago when he uh, came. I think it was when he went up to 170 and he's usually 155, went up to 170 to fight Diaz. Yeah. 
And he, you know, he took the, he took the fight a little last notice, put on, you know, 15 pounds was saying, I'm eating steaks for breakfast, you know, like, and then he went in there and exactly what I was afraid of happened and he tired out and, you know, Diaz just ended up. He's, he's admitted since that fight that he was drinking his, uh, that proper, proper 12, what is his, his liquor? Uh, his, uh, <laughs> yeah. is, is it called pro- proper 12 or? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, he's. I've seen some interviews where he's actually admitted to, you know, okay, I not only was eating the steaks, but I, you know, I didn't take it as seriously. But you know, that brings up a good point. Like, uh, you know, again, big UFC fan, gonna watch the fights this weekend. I haven't. I got to look at the entire card, but I know there was some good fights on there. Uh, Mackenzie Dern, who's a uh, a championship, a world champion jujitsu fighter, uh, has been has been has transitioned into MMA, so she's on that card. That's that's one just one reason alone for me to want to see it. She's been doing really good. Just had a kid last year, and she's still she's back into the UFC like in four months. But um, yeah, like you know, guys like McGregor and 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 uh, uh, some of these guys that are fighting like catch weight fights now are finding that it's better to walk into the ring at your walking around weight, maybe, a little, you know, okay, if you're walking around weight is 185, 175, 175, because you're just going to probably naturally lose the, uh, the, those 10 pounds in, uh, in, uh, in, your, in your camp versus having to diet and get it down. And, you know, so those guys are finding more success and coming out of those fights saying, I, f- I never felt better. I had never felt better than fighting at that weight. So you're seeing a lot more of that. And, and I'm not sure, you know, how many people know about this, but I mean, the UFC has really integrated a week of strategy where they are monitoring their weight. And if they feel like they've got to cut too much weight at the last minute, and I don't know that they've done it a lot, but they have done it where they'll call off a fight or put somebody else in because somebody is just so far over the weight that they're going to have to hurt their body to get down to the, to the weight, to make weight that, that, you know, they've instituted this plan where they, they check on you, have doctors, you have to check them with the doctor the entire week of, so gone are the days of trying to cut 20 pounds in two days. It just don't let you do it anymore. Yeah. It's, it's kind of freakish seeing cutting weight is a weird thing. I, I remember some of my friends wrestled, like I said, I didn't wrestle, but watching some of them cut, seeing some of these guys, even when they come to the weigh-ins, um, and, and just the facial structure, the way they look, it's just like, well, you don't look healthy. <laughs> like, Yeah, very drawn out. When I, I again, I, and I wrestled only in junior high, uh, I think it was seventh and eighth grade, then I transitioned to football. I wasn't good at either of those things, by the way. Um, but I, when I wrestled, I did have to make weight. Even if we weren't going to be a starter, you had to make weight. I used to wrap my stomach with uh, saran wrap. Yeah. My legs, any, any place where it was a little meaty, right? Legs and stomach. And then look, a bunch of like sweaters and sweats on. I, I never really did the, the, the suit, yeah. uh, the, 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 the sweatsuit, the plastic suit. Uh, but I wrap myself up, throw on a bunch of sweaters and then ride the bike in front of the TV for just hours uh, to make sure that, that I made weight. So uh, on, a, on a very small level as a, as a teenager, I've had to do that. That was never fun. Not eating the whole day before because you needed to make weight. Never a fun thing. I couldn't imagine that was hard enough to go in and weigh in a half hour before you've got to wrestle. Yeah. I couldn't imagine having to drop 20 pounds in a week and then have to go get punched in the face. <laughs> you're, you're already drawn in weak, and I don't care how much Gatorade and Pedialyte or whatever it is that you drink to, to rehydrate. I couldn't imagine that. I, and I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing that they've instituted a lot of these rules. Now, there are times where they let these, these fighters go. You know, the UFC ultimately is a company and they get to make their own rules. So every once in a while, you see a guy that's over by half a pound. I don't know if you've seen any of these videos where they, they move the little weight over on the scale. They move it so quick. Oh, yeah, he's in. He's good. But, and then they get rid of it because they're not going to cancel that money fight, right? They just throw it off to the side. Yeah, yeah, he's good. But, and, and they move it before the cameras can even, you know, uh, uh, get, a, get a picture or, or really even zoom in. But I'm glad that they have, for the safety of the fighters, that they've been doing more about that. But, I, you know, again, couldn't imagine having to, to cut 20 pounds to go get punched and kicked and, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's bad. It's bad enough getting punched and kicked when you've had a good meal five hours before or for the whole entire week. You know, so, uh, so yeah, I, I hats off to those guys. It's one of the reasons I love it though. Those guys are warriors. Oh, absolute warriors. 
going back to the history side of things, I even for jujitsu, speaking on jujitsu, I, I was doing all this digging on the history side of things. And I, I saw that it goes even as far back to India, like 4,000 years ago with Buddhist monks who, when they're traveling around, and like we said earlier with the gentle art and, and being able to submit someone in that way, that these Buddhist monks would even practice some form of jujitsu, probably obviously not what it is today, but Mm -hmm. to protect themselves on the road, but peacefully protect themselves in that self-defense. I just thought that was so crazy. That aspect of this worldwide uh, sport and art, which you don't really see. I mean, obviously soccer is kind of worldwide, but really martial arts and jujitsu and, and, you know, MMA, what they have done with it becoming a worldwide phenomenon we have a question from Tay, who is actually from New Zealand, and it, it's along the lines of, do you think jiu-jitsu is noticeably different in different cultures and lo- locations, or do you think it kind of uh, is pretty same along all playing fields? No, completely different, completely different. I mean, I think uh, I'll use the word bougie. Uh, <laughs> everyone who's before you is a little bit bougie about what you're doing, like they're looking down on you. You know, yep. so the guys in Japan look down upon the guys in Brazil. The guys in Brazil, I'll tell you, fact, look down on us here in the U.S. Even though the Gracies have brought it here, there's, you'll always hear the stories of, well, back in Brazil, you know, we train with no AC, you know, out in the sun on the beach. Like, you know, so everybody kind of looks at everybody else differently. Brazil, you know, when we say jujitsu, here in the U.S., we've started to take out the Brazilian side. Like, and we don't always say Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Because now there's Brazilian jiu-jitsu was brought to the U.S. by the Gracies. But now you've got people that have gone two different routes. There's Gracie jiu-jitsu. And then there's competitive jiu-jitsu, which is the point fighting, which is the tournament side. So now that it's, it's evolved further. Now, there are people in Brazil and even old school guys here who own gyms. My, my coach is from Brazil, but he didn't do jiu-jitsu until he was here in the States. Everyone has their own take on, you know, what they want to teach. I go to a gym where it's a, li- a little bit more, as, when it, as it pertains to the adults, it's a little bit more of hobbyist jiu-jitsu. Some of our adults are starting to compete. Some of the kids have grown into the adults class and are competing. And, and that's a good evolution of any school. You've, you know, you got a lot of kids that start. Those kids are with you for years. They grow into men and, and they want to compete. Again, my school was almost always like a hobbyist school. Now we've got that competition side. It is two different types of jujitsu. Yeah. I am not going to point fight if I have to protect myself on the street. And I mean, I get, I get points for taking you down. I get points for getting moving to the side, to your side. I get points for throwing, getting my knee over and mounting you. I get points for getting your back. I don't have to submit you, but right there, I amass points. So there are schools that teach that side. So then there's the, you know, the, the self-defense side, the street side, the, the side that they do do a lot more MMA classes. So it's kind of evolved, but yes, it's completely different everywhere. The tournament side of it has gone worldwide, but if you go to Brazil, you're learning hardcore jujitsu. Yeah. It just so happens that you're going to learn the point system, as opposed to there are people here in the U.S. who have only ever trained to compete. When I was a white belt, my coach, I again, at, by this time I was 41. I did my first tournament. I was still 41. Six months in, I went to my coach and I said, I want to do the local competition that's coming. And his eyes, he was a competitor. His eyes went like this and he goes, well, we have to change the way we train. And it completely changed because I didn't understand that I had knee on belly is so many points. If I take somebody's back versus what we were doing was learning moves and learning more of self-defense, street jujitsu. He was in law enforcement. How do you subdue somebody? How do you hold somebody? And it just completely changed and went a whole nother route. And then I looked, so every school makes that decision whether it's because that's just what, where the coach comes from in their background, or you know, it's necessary because you have certain students that want to go a certain route. You might have a class. Uh, we've done the occasional class or um, you know, like kind of like after a regular class where they'll do like a law enforcement class where, okay, how, you know, holds and how do you grab somebody? How do you get the cuffs on? How would I hold them here? 
and, and that in of itself is a whole conversation to have with everything that's happened in the U.S. this last year or last few years where police just don't know how to subdue somebody and they have to use the gun instead of being able to calm somebody down and hold them down. So, uh, yeah, it's different everywhere, but I don't think you'll have any two people that will agree on what the best jujitsu is. We actually did a podcast episode of street jujitsu versus competition jujitsu. It was one of our most downloaded episodes because people wanted to hear, well, what was your take? Again, it's different for everyone. Just like you might be a basketball guy. I do jujitsu. My daughter does soccer. Like, it, you know, everybody has their own thing. There are, it, there's that inside of jujitsu, competitive self-defense. I want to, you know, be able to beat somebody in the ring, you know, so we all have our reason. Absolutely. Well, Milton, you have a wide variety of things that you've done. Like you said, jujitsu is this passion that came on later in life. You have the marketing background, you have the podcast and the We Defy Foundation and all of these different things. And to a lot of people, that seems success, like success. We hear this word a lot as success and, and whether it's success in jujitsu or success in life or relationships, what is your definition of success and in just general terms, what is success to you? Ah, uh, you know, that's a really, I grapple with that question every day. Uh, I do my own mental jujitsu with that question every single day. It is, uh, it's very difficult. I've been doing sales, some form of sales since I was in my early twenties. Um, I was a stockbroker in New York, moved to Florida to, to work for a company down here, got into marketing. Uh, so uh, it, it's been difficult. Uh, you know, I was having this conversation with my wife last night, actually. And I've always said, my career has never been the company I worked for. My career, I'm a salesman. That's my career. Yeah. I could sell anything anywhere. Give me three facts and I feel like I can get on the phone and do it. I happen to love where I work and I love, love marketing because I love helping companies start from nothing or, uh, you know, giving them a roadmap and having them follow that roadmap to success. Um, Success for me, though, it's I'm, again, really literally grappling with that now. Is success more time with my family? Is success more money in the bank? Is success uh, being able to hire people to run the company and I can go sit margaritas on the beach? I, I think it's, it's kind of a, a, a little bit all of the above. But I can tell you that I walked away from a job. Everybody thought I was successful. I was making almost 200 grand a year. I was the vice president of a moving brokerage. You know, we would basically, uh, it was like, uh, be, uh, set up somebody's entire move, give them a quote, set up the move, move the car, maybe an animal's got to go on a plane, like literally do everything for them. And again, making, uh, moved up in the organization within just four years, was the VP of the company. Everybody else gauged that success on the car that I drove, the apartment and where, that I lived in, where it was, condo on the beach. Everybody looked at that but I was miserable. I walked away from that job to run my first t-shirt company, which I overlapped. I knew that I was going to leave and I, need, I needed something. So I started making funny t-shirts. That made me happy. I was at that point, I was like, I felt success. Now that didn't work out, but I was, I would drive to work in the morning when I worked for that moving company. And by the time I pulled into the parking lot, I had my first tension headache because I knew what I had to deal with that day. Dealing with movers is not easy. And we dealt with hundreds of movers all around the country. And we're setting up a move, but other you know, movers actually got to do it. So it, it's definitely not just money. There, it ha there has to, that has to be part of it, or you're going to be living in a box under a bridge. But I think success to me is, is a happy medium. Money, family. And what I'm realizing more now, more than ever, is time. We didn't talk about this, but I had a heart attack a couple of years ago. Wow. So yeah, I had a heart attack. I have four stents. Uh, you know, they do a, cath a catheter and they go into your heart and they actually put these, you know, four mesh stents. Yeah. And ever since then, I realized the most valuable thing that I have is my time. Mm -hmm. I'll tell like uh, growing up, my dad used to change the oil in the car, change, you know, he'd do the brakes, right? Uh, you know, old school guy for yeah. me, that's a whole day of work. I want to take my car. It's not that I want to spend the money or I think I have lots of money. The time that I can gain from having somebody do that for me is just like one example of how valuable I feel my time is. Um, I'm always multitasking. I could be on a sale on the phone and I'm on my phone answering another email. 
you know, I could be on my, uh, on my computer and you know, like uh, on the work phone and then be on my phone doing something else, uh, sending an email to another client, or just doing something yeah. that the time is what I'm learning at 47 is the most ba- valuable thing that I have. So if there's a happy medium between the money that I make, the time that I have with my family, for myself, being able to do jujitsu and do the things that make me happy, money is definitely not the only thing anymore. I thought it was. People looked at me and thought I was crazy when I left that job. What are you doing? My family said, what are you doing? You're crazy. You're going to run a t-shirt company? I bought two houses right before I was like flipping. This was before 2008. So I was flipping these houses. So what are you doing? Well, I got the money in the houses. I'm going to get that money back. It was a nightmare to sell them. I didn't get the money back right away. Like things started to fall apart. But I was never, I was more happy with that struggle than I was working at a company making 200 grand, almost 200 grand. And just not being happy with what I was doing, the stress, the, you know, dealing with clients, dealing with movers that didn't do the right thing. So if, if there is an answer in there, it's the answer is I'm still learning, but I'm starting to learn the balance side. And if my wife can hear me in the other room, she's probably going balance. He doesn't Yeah, geez. I'm trying to tell him he needs to be more balanced. And that, you know, it's the truth. I'm trying to find that balance. It's not easy especially when you get addicted to something like jujitsu and now it's jujitsu, it's a jujitsu podcast, it's the t-shirts, it's like, you know, so much. Yeah. So it, it, it's hard. I, I don't think I'll ever be a, a, an incredible success at being able to balance those things. Uh, you know? I think that's that balance, that chi or whatever we want to call it is something that we all are, all are continuously searching for. You know, there's things when you ask that question and when I think of the question, it's, it's like, yeah, that may be how it is now, but 10 years from now that may change. But I think one thing that will never change and you mentioned it is time. Like, I think that is our most valuable commodity and you definitely can attest to that with having a heart attack. So, I mean, it's, that's, that's definitely uh, something that will always be on my mind, but I think. I I kind of almost think, you know, there's uh, people will say something along the lines of like, um, you know, it's the journey. We do say that a lot in jujitsu. It's the journey. Like every time, like every belt, like I tell one of the things that we do on, on the jujitsu dummies podcast is we, we give a lot of advice to the younger guys. It was the reason why we did it. We would have such good conversations. And I always used to say, I wish the white belts could hear this. Yeah. And I wish we recorded that conversation about the craziness that we went through and the weird gym that we were at and the drama. Mm-hmm. And and we always really wish that we can tell those guys, you know, that thing, you know, that like what we went through. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's always that, there's, there's always that element of enjoying the journey. You know, it's every belt, when you're a white belt, you just want to be a blue belt so bad. You want respect. You want to be able to show it. When you get to blue belt, it's like it got hard and now they're really beating up on me. I didn't know it was going to be this hard. When you get to purple, you're going like, now it's, now it's on. Now it's serious because I might be doing the warm-ups. I might run a class. I might have to teach. Uh, I, might, you know, I might be the guy that they bring in a black belt from another gym or you got a visitor. Hey, you're maybe the ranking belt. I'm at the point where I'm, if it wasn't for COVID, I maybe would be a brown belt already. I'm at purple belt. You start to go, I don't want the brown belt. <laughs> There's a lot of responsibility that goes along with it, but it's, it's, we almost always feel like we don't deserve it, yeah. but I still enjoy the journey. I enjoy the journey. And one of the things with belts is you don't get the belt because you know everything that you need to know at brown belt. You get the brown belt because now you have to learn the things that you need to know at brown belt. Uh, and the same thing with black people like I, I got the black belt. Okay, that's it. Hang it up. You, that never happens. If you can still get on the mat, you get your black belt. I see the posts every day. They get their black belt and they say, and now the journey begins because you are the white belt of new black belts. There is so much more expected of you. Uh, and then, you know, we put stripes for, for to, to represent degrees. It's usually four degrees between every belt. So you get four stripes and then you'll get a promotion. So it's usually if you, if you train a lot, it's like every six months, you should be getting a stripe. Every couple of years, you get a new belt. But yeah, the, there's, there's this, you know, you know, right now for me, like I'm good being a purple belt. <laughs> not that I'm scared of the expectations, but I know what is expected of me. And not just by my coach, but people come into the gym 
And it's like, oh, he's a brown belt, so he must know this. I can roll harder with him. I could do this with him. You know, maybe you get a little bit of a target on your back from the purple belts and the guy they want, he's a brown belt. I could take the old man. You know, you kind of get that. So uh, again, you know, at the end of the day, it's the journey. And I think it's, I'm learning more and more that I just enjoy the journey. I'm not in a place where I'm so obsessed about the belt. It's going to be great when I get a brown belt. And if I can last long enough to get a black belt, but it, it's this journey is so fun. And because I have all of these, these things that are related to jujitsu around me, I'm just enjoying all of it. I have, I look at my phone now and I have some like really, really big names. I got the cell phone numbers of some really big names in our world that we're getting on the podcast or talking to, or we've talked to already. That's amazing. So I, that's part of my jujitsu journey. It's not just what I learned on the mat anymore. I'm an ambassador, you know, not only for We Five, I'm an ambassador for jujitsu. So I love having these conversations again. Thank you for having me. And I, you know, I, get, I, I think you could see, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> I, if, if I could get paid what I get paid in my regular job, I would talk about this all day long, every single day. I'd be doing 10 podcasts a day. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's awesome that you said and talked about the journey because that is something that we harp on on this show all the time. Like, Welcome to the journey. This is something that when I started this show, it wasn't like, hey, let me show you what I know. Like, it's like, no, come with me. We're all on this journey together. Let's go learn from all these people. Let's go learn about jujitsu. Let's go learn about mindset and business or whatever, whatever the guest may be or wherever the podcast takes us, right? So it, it is something that the journey is something that we have to you know, take a hold of because pr- tomorrow's not promised. Yeah. And and uh, we're only here for, for a small period of time. So, How long have you been podcasting now? How long have you been doing this? This has been, and this, we're coming up on probably like seven or eight months now. Okay. Good for you, man. Yeah, we're getting close to the year. So it's been 40, I think we're about 40 episodes, 41 episodes in. So okay. it's been good. It's been a- doing way more than me. We do, we do like two a month. Yeah. Um, just be, I, I have a producer and I have typically like to have my two co-hosts because the, really the concept of the podcast originally was a round table. It was just, remember I said I would go out with these guys and have a beer and we'd have these really cool conversations. Well, that was, that was it. I, there was five of us when we first started. Now there's like a core three. Um, because of COVID, we don't bring in our guests right now. We do almost everything via Zoom. But when we did do it, And that was the most fun because it was just us sitting around, maybe drinking some beers on that show, whatever it may be, uh, and and talking about jujitsu. So it wasn't, I wasn't always the guy just talking about my journey, but we were having these discussions about, you know, I've got a, a, one co-host is a black belt. One is a blue belt. I'm purple. Uh, The guest might be a brown, like, and you're just getting all of this different advice and maybe sometimes reminiscing about where we were, but at the end of the day, enjoying the journey. So Right now we do we do two a month. I'm, I'm we just recorded number thirty two, and I'm going on uh, May will be two years. So we do we do fewer because we do have those guys, and I have a producer who uh, used to be a partner of mine in, in business who does all the technical stuff. So I like that he does that. I don't like to. I'm not a technical guy. I'm the. I do a lot of this. I do a lot of the talking. But I have some really cool people behind me and alongside of me that have really made this cool. I'd love to get to a place where we were doing at least one a week, or maybe at least three a month with a week off here or there. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm only 32 in, two, oh, two years in, but only 32 podcasts in. So you've got, uh, you've got a lot more going than me. You'll, you'll, in a year and a half, you're going to be way past me. <laughs> hey, it's a, it is a grind. Let me tell you, it's a grind, but it's just like you're passionate about jujitsu. I'm passionate about this. Uh, not only being able to help people in this format, but also just being able to learn so and meet so many cool people like yourself and, <laughs> And uh, I really appreciate you coming on, Milton. It's been an incredible conversation. And we talked a little bit about the podcast, Jiu-Jitsu for Dummies, right? Jiu-Jitsu. It's, 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 the, it's really Jiu-Jitsu Dummies. We don't want to get in trouble with the, uh, the, the For Dummies company. <laughs> right. But Jiu-Jitsu Dummies, and is that the Instagram tag? Where can everyone find yeah. it? You can find us everywhere at Jiu-Jitsu Dummies. Uh, we have other pages for the foundation and some of the other things we do, but everything is centered around, you know, we have a, a, a link tree in the bio. So if you click on the, the link in our bio at Jiu-Jitsu Dummies, so it's J-I-U, uh, J-I-T-S-U, and then Dummies spelled with I-E-S, not, the, not, not with a Y. <laughs> so Jiu-Jitsu Dummies, you can find everything about us. you find us everywhere. 
And, uh, you know, we do both, uh, you know, the podcast and essentially like a video cast that, you know, we record and, and launch on YouTube, uh, you know, again, a couple of months. Perfect. No, and thank you so much for coming on and, and spreading the wealth. And obviously, you're extremely passionate. I had so much fun, learned a bunch and hope to have you on again soon sometime. Thank you, man. I'll, I'll look out for my invitation. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate you, man. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening everybody to another episode of the breathe and air podcast go check milton out and if you're interested in jujitsu i'm sure he'd be happy to field some questions for y'all too um yep. you're listening on apple Podcasts. go ahead and hit that beautiful little purple we're talking about purple belt that purple subscribe and then leave a comment if you like today's episode if you think somebody would get something out of this episode if you think they would benefit from jujitsu then share it. We don't ask for much on the show, but share the wealth. If you think someone has a certain life circumstance that jujitsu would really help, maybe a stress reliever, maybe for fitness, whatever it may be, maybe you want to get your partner out of the house <laughs> for a couple hours a day, share the podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning into another episode and have a great rest of your week.